Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know if there's any other time of day, but if there is, we wish you a good one. My name is Brad Keeler. I'm the director of the GEO Institute, and we are happy to bring you the third in our series of ISFOG. That's the International Symposium on Frontiers and Offshore Geotechnics pre-conference webinars. Good morning workshops today. If you don't know anything about the GEO Institute, we are a technical society housed within the American Society of Civil Engineers. We have about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists. You can find out more information at geoinstitute.org. Of course, if you like what you see today, and I think you will, you should do a couple of things. You should click subscribe down below the box that you're watching this in. You should click get notifications. And if you do those two things, we will let you know every single time we post something to our YouTube channel. It's a very exciting day at the Geo Institute, a very exciting week. We, of course, have Geo Congress 22 coming up next week in Charlotte. St. Patrick's Day is later this week. Yesterday was Pi Day. There's a lot going on. And the registration for this conference that we'll be talking about a little bit this morning, ISFOG, opens tomorrow, March 16th. And you can find out more about that at geoinstitute.org or at isfog2020.org. Our moderator, our MC this morning, is about to take things away. It is Arash Zakari from BP, and I will now turn it over to him for the technical portion of this morning. Arash, welcome. Thank you very much, Brad. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our third uh, series of webinar. My name is Arash Sakri. I'm a geotechnical advisor with BP, and today I have the pleasure of moderating this uh, this talk. Um, <clears throat> before we started with the talk, let's uh, let's go through a couple of housekeeping matters. As as Brad mentioned, the register early registration will open tomorrow, March 16th. This this is uh, we're planning to have our our conference as in person in August of this year. Prior to starting the conference on August 28, we have six one-hour pre-conference workshops followed by the conference itself, which is uh, comprises plenary and parallel sessions as well as keynote lectures and McLaughlin lecture. Proceedings are, are, are going to be published and, and made available that include all the keynote lectures and made available to registrants right away. Um, <clears throat> as, as mentioned earlier, this is our third um, series of conference. We have three other conferences coming up on April 28, May 19, and June 23rd. Please pencil in those dates in your in your calendars, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment and, and thank our conference and sponsors, to start with Platinum and sponsors, Benthic, Fugro, TDI Brooks, GeoEquip, and Alaska, as well as NGI. Our goal to sponsor is BP followed by C Silver Sponsor, Geosynthetic, and Bronze Sponsors, Center for Offshore Foundation Systems, and, and National Geotechnique Centrifuge Facility. So we have two speakers today. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Farouk Nadim, or Professor Nadim, as I had the honor of being his student. Um, Dr. Professor Nadim is a technical director at NGI. Um, he's, a, he's a former director of Norwegian Center of Excellence for Geohazard. He, he is also an ad, adjunct professor at University of Oslo and Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Sheriff University of Technology and Master's and Doctorate of Science from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Professor Nadine joined NGI in 1982, where he made major contributions to advancing science and technology in the fields of onshore and offshore geohazards, um, including over 280 scientific publications. He also chaired the Technical Committee 304 for ISSMGE for Engineering Practice and Risk Assessment. Our second guest speaker is Professor Barry Lehan. Professor Leon is a both, both a practitioner and education, educator since 1984. He joined his civil, he obtained his civil engineering degree from University College Court in Ireland, and then and then started working practicing with, with Arab Geotechnics in London, where, where he started his PhD at Imperial College of London in 1989. 
Following completion of his PhD in 1992, Professor Li Han continued practicing with Arab in London and Hong Kong before taking up a lecturing position at Trinity College in Dublin in 1994. Professor Li Han moved to Perth in 2002 and has remained as a, as a professor at University of Western Australia as, um, and, and continued educating many students and, and, and as well as contributing, practicing and contributing to advancing science. His, his accomplishment has been, pub, uh, 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 has been published in, in over 300 um, technical papers. Professor Lihan continues practicing and, and educating future engineers. Without further ado, I'll welcome our first guest speaker, Dr. Uh, Nadine. Well, uh, thank you very much, Arash, for your kind introduction. Um, I will start sharing my screen and I hope this thing works. Um, yes, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you are. I'm uh, glad to hear that this uh, uh, webinar today has over 800 participants from all over the globe. And I hope that uh, uh, for some of you, it's probably very late at night. And, and, and I hope that it's, it's, you find it worthwhile staying up to, to listen to this uh, webinar. Uh, what uh, me and Barry will be presenting today is this new unified CPT-based method for calculation of axial pile capacity in sand. But before we start on the technical parts of the presentation, I'll just give you a little bit of background about why this uh, method was developed and how the whole thing started. Actually, we have to go back about eight years. The whole thing started in, in 1984, and it started with something may be completely different. At that time, we started a joint industry project to look at the reliability of API and uh, four CPT-based axial pile capacity calculation methods. This was a project that was executed jointly by NGI and University of Western Australia, and it, um, the primary drive, driver for this project was the oil company Equinor, which is uh, used to be called Start Oil in, in those days. And the reason this original JIP started is that at the time, the offshore design codes, uh, the most common ones, which is API and ISO, they uh, allowed the designers to use the new CPT-based uh, methods for design of um, piles in sand. But uh, they didn't specify what sort of safety factors should be used when you use these methods. And the text was a little bit uh, ambiguous. They required the same level of safety for the new pile capacity design methods as for the uh, traditional API method. So if a designer wanted to use one of these CPT-based methods, they had basically two options. They could either be conservative and use a very high factor of safety, to make sure that nobody questions the level of safety that's achieved with their design, but then that would be kind of a, uh, defeating the purpose of using a modern design method. The other way of going about that was doing a complete reliability analysis and, and demonstrate that these, uh, the reliability that's achieved with these methods is uh, comparable to what is the um, target values in the industry. And uh, the, the purpose of the JIP was to do exactly that, to um, calibrate these CPT-based methods and come up with um, recommendations for partial resistance factors to be used with the methods if you want to achieve a certain level of safety. Um, we basically had to do three uh, separate tasks in this thing. First of all, we had to gather a unified uh, database of uh, high-quality pile load tests because uh, one problem that we found out very quickly was that every uh, one who was proposing a CPT-based method, they were using a different database. So that made it very difficult to compare them to each other. Uh, once we had done that, then we had to do a calibration of the resistance factors for uh, enough realistic case studies so you could generalize and come up with some general recommendations. And finally, our aim was to transfer our conclusions to the design codes for, for the industry. The original JIP team com was comprised of uh, uh, my colleagues at NGI, Barry and his colleagues at UWA, 
We also had a team of experts, which had one representative from each of the four CPT-based methods that were considered in the JIP. Here's the list of the methods that we looked into in the previous JIP. It was the API method for pile design in sand, and then it was the NGI method, the Imperial College method, the FUGRO method, and the UWA method. And the reason that you see the 05 after, well, most of these methods is that it was in, uh, in um, API um, revision in 2005 that these methods were um, recommended for the first time. We also looked into some CPT-based methods for pile design in clay, but that's a separate story. Maybe it would be a topic of a future seminar in this, uh, in this series. Now, when we finished the original JIP in 2018, uh, we came up with some recommendations for different safety factors for the different methods. But one of our recommendations that the steering committee supported quite enthusiastically is that it's not a desirable situation to give the option to designers to choose among five methods. It has some unfortunate side effects. You know, some people um, try to use the method that gives them the shortest file length. Some people gives them, use the method that gives them the longest file just to be conservative. Some people use, for example, the Imperial College method because they've been educated at Imperial College, and some people use the NGI method because they work at NGI. So uh, there was there was a great pressure from the industry to uh, not to have so many options, and and these methods were so similar to each other that we thought, okay, why not come up with a unified method which is not affiliated? We're not going to call it anybody's method, just a unified CPD-based method and see what's the best we can do and then have a simple method that can be used in the industry. So uh, why was the timing correct? When I say now, I'm referring to November 2018. Uh, there were several reasons that made this possible. One thing was that we had already established this unified database of high quality pilot tests, so we could calibrate our new method with that database. We had a team of experts representing the four CPD-based methods in place, so that was already taken care of. We had good momentum from the previous JIP. We had very good contact with the committees working on the API and ISO guidelines. And a new revision of the guidelines was going to come up in 2020. Actually, it's been delayed a year or so because of the pandemic. But that also gave us an incentive to, to finish this new unified method before the new revision comes up. So, uh, as I mentioned, we already had the uh, four CPT-based methods with one representative in this uh, JIP. For the extension of the JIP, we also added uh, Dr. Philippe Jean Jean from BP as kind of the spokesman for the traditional API method. So uh, the new JIP or the new method that was the extension of the previous JIP had a team of experts composed of the people you see on, on the screen right now. And what was uh, to be achieved in this JIP extension? Well, as I mentioned, we wanted to have a new CPT-based method that's calibrated against the pilot test in the unified database. Uh, it was uh, the formulation should be straightforward and we shouldn't require any tests which are not common geotechnical tests. So if we were going to recommend any spe specific tests, it had to be routine tests that are typically carried out in site investigations offshore. We uh, had the aim of reducing the method uncertainty. As you know, all these design methods are uh, are uh, empirical methods, so the method uncertainty is a big contributor to the uncertainty in your uh, design. And uh, we aim to have consensus opinion among this team of experts. So nobody would uh, come later on and say, well, you didn't take care of this factor or that factor. So uh, at this stage, I give the uh, floor to Professor Barry Lehan from uh, UWA. He will explain the theory behind the unified method, the design equations that we considered along the way, and the final design equations that uh, we recommend to the ISO API. And once Barry is finished with his presentation, I just say a few words about the reliability of this method and, and uh, what you would what you should expect when you uh, 
um, use this method in actual design. So I'll stop my presentation. I hope this works. So Barry, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, hopefully you can see my screen, is that okay? Yes, we see it, it's perfect. Oh. Um, uh, thanks, Farouk, um, and uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Um, so it sounds a bit scary to see uh, here of over 800 people, but anyway, I'll do my best. Um, like, as mentioned, the, the webinar uh, relates to the component of the joint industry project dealing with the development of the unified method for driven piles in sand. And my presentation uh, this evening is really to present to find the, the summary of the paper uh, listed here, which is which is included in the ESPOC uh, proceedings. Uh, I'd like to first of all acknowledge the significant contribution of this fairly lengthy list of, of co-authors from around the world, um, as well as the uh, a lengthy list of sponsors, as 12, 12 energy companies, and also to thank the ESPOC uh, organization committee for inviting us to, to give this uh, presentation. So to just give you some of the steps that we followed to develop this uh, unaffiliated unified method, um, first of all, required input and agreement, which was no mean feat from authors of the four existing CPT methods in API, uh, input and agreement from the GIP steering committee, which is a, a group of a lot of uh, and external assessors, and also representatives of the 12 energy companies. So it certainly wasn't done in isolation. There was plenty of discussion, lots of discussion around uh, the, the coming up with a consensus or a compromise. There's nothing is everybody's going to agree with everything. So that was that was a challenge and managed, thankfully, successfully managed to achieve that. In terms of the method, um, we had to uh, agree that the formulations would be based, based on an agreed set of established and reasonable physical mechanisms. So it wasn't like a neural network type of approach where you just put in all the parameters and hope for the best. Uh, basically, it had, because the databases were quite small that we were calibrating with, we had to be based uh, the method on, on established physical mechanisms. Um, Farouk mentioned the unified database, and this is really absolute key to the whole method uh, because, uh, I mean, certainly having been party to lots of different databases, uh, there's lots of different levels of interpretation, different ways of looking at things. So, uh, you know, at the initial part of the GIP, 2014 to 2017, where uh, we basically painstakingly went through over 300 pile low static load tests um, and came up eventually with 71 pile load tests for which we could stand over. Everybody agreed. Everybody was saying this is a this is this is an appropriate test to include in the in the database. So. That step in itself, I thought, was a really good in trying to actually get some, some overall consensus. Um, and obviously, the overall aim was to produce a method which was applicable to offshore uh, driven piles. And most of the piles which are in our, our database are actually relatively small piles. So therefore, we had to basically do a realistic extrapolation um, and obviously err a little bit on the conservative side outside of that uh, database. So in terms of limitations of the method, um, it applies uh, only to silica sands um, with, a, with a soil behavior type IC index less than about 2.1. So that covers most sands. Not So, so it's likely to underestimate capacities in very silty sands with IC values, say, between 2.1 and 2.6, and overestimate capacities in gravelly sand where there's potentially higher uh, QC values that is represent then representative of the matrix of the of the of the gravelly sand. Um, limitation is that the database is relatively small, so basically the, the actual uh, analysis, as you'll see afterwards, had to be tailored to actually understanding what implications we had when we were calibrating against a relatively small database to make sure we weren't making any um, silly silly mistakes. And of course, the database also includes things like closed-ended piles, which are not used offshore, but yet provide us with valuable information, as do piles with the relatively small diameters. In terms of what we strove for in this GIP, we wanted to provide a prediction of the medium-term capacity 
defined at about two weeks after driving. So that's more or less when all the static load tests were conducted. So that's the median of the static load test conducted. So we're not looking at any long-term gains in shaft friction, which can be considerable. And also, we're only looking at driven piles. We're not looking at vibrated piles or other types of piles um, in, in, in the analysis. Now, in terms of the actual um, mechanism of shaft friction, that is controlling the, the, the pile capacity for long piles, we need to, uh, we're not doing anything strange in that we're basically assuming Coulomb's friction law, not unlike the initial API uh, K tan delta approach, where we say the shear strength, the shear, ultimate shear stress developed on the side of a pile is the radial effect of stress times the coefficient of friction tan delta. And the radial effect of stress is comprised of two components. One is a stationary value, which is there in place um, before you load the pile. And then there's a component which actually changes as you load the pile to failure, and that's called the delta sigma RD component. So um, as part of the method, we need to have a look clo more closely at what, what is actually governing those three circled uh, parameters. Now, the first one is, is fairly straightforward. Um, instrumented pile tests, were, which were uh, equipped, instrumented piles equipped with radial stress sensors or horizontal stress sensors, uh, match or predict here the display the, the actual variation of shear stress with radial effective stress um, as you load a pile to failure. So you start off at some point here and then you move along and you can see in here you're getting an increase. And finally, you come up with this, uh, more or less in this case here, a 28 degree uh, um, interface friction actor. So that's one example of a, of a series of load tests. On others, there's, these are three just spinning on the screen. Axis and then Lim have also done similar tests. And they've all confirmed the, 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 the idea that the, rate, the, the, the ultimate shaft friction is controlled by the, the Coulomb friction law. It's also been observed, and I won't go into it in this talk, but the friction in tension tends to be a little 25% uh, less than the friction in compression. And that seemed to be very consistent throughout the entire database uh, that we analyzed. Um, I suppose the most, the, the, the most important difference between these, the method, this unified method and the, the API K-Tan Delta or Beta method is the, the notion that the, the radial effect of stress, the stationary radial effect of stress acting on a pile is actually directly proportional to the CPT QC value. And it is, if you think about near the tip of a pile, your, your horizontal stress is not probably far off the limit pressure of a pressure meter, which is direct, directly related to the QC value. But it also depends not just simply on the, the distance from the ground surface to the particular point, it depends on the distance uh, from the pile tip. So in this example here, we have um, the red line here is a series of radial stress measurements made as you drove this pile into the ground, and these are the measurements made with this red sensor, as shown here. Similar, sim simultaneously, while you're driving in the pile, you measure stresses on the, using the green sensor here, and we get another distribution of, of radial effective stresses acting on a pile looking like this. Now, they're both uh, at, in the same soil horizon, say at two meters depth, we've got quite a different stress. One is the, the one in one case, it's 175 kPa, and the other case is about 90 kPa. And that's in exactly the same depth. So the, the fact is that the radial effective stress is not just depend, is not dependent on the depth uh, per se of the actual uh, sensor below the ground level. Now you should drive your pile deeper, you can see here we go another uh, distance here where, where we were uh, initially at this point here. Um, we were at, say, 60 kPa. As we drove our pile further down in exactly the same horizon, we end up with a lower stress. So the basic, so this, the entire, the existing CPT methods in API and the unified method rely on this simple uh, correlation where it's just saying that the radial effect, stationary radial effect of stress depends on the QC value and depends on the distance uh, of the location of the soil horizon from the particular uh, tip of the pile. Now that could be divided by the diameter. We'll come back to that point in a second. But H here is the distance from the tip of the pile. It's nothing to do with the depth uh, from the ground level. So that is the, the basic um, uh, argument. Now that's 
these measurements, all of these instrument and pile test measurements were made uh, for closed-ended piles. When we want to actually consider the, the influence of an open-ended pile, we need to allow for the fact that the radial effect of stress in, in tests that have been observed they in, increases with a degree of sand displacement. So if you have a fully coring pile which has been drive, driven into the ground, the radial effect of stress is acting on the shaft of that pile tends to be much lower than that of a closed end of pile which induces far greater uh, displacement. Now, the actual, uh, the, ra the, the radial stress acting on an open end of pile can be roughly obtained from the ratio of a radial stress on an open end of pile, the ratio here, of the radius stress on an open-ended pile to that on a closed-ended pile can be assessed from uh, cavity expansion theory by assuming that the distribution of stresses in the far field are the same for a given volume of the space soil. And with that hypothesis, we come up with a relationship be between the ratio of the open to closed-ended ra radial effect of stress being a function of the area ratio, and that's the area relative to the area of a closed-ended pile, and that can be written in an alternative form using the incremental filling ratio, some of you may be familiar with, um, and the internal diameter and, and the diameter of the pile. So that gives us a hypothesis. We're not saying that that number is exactly the case, but it's giving us a hypothesis to, and it, which is in keeping with existing test data, although there is not a lot of test data on uh, radius stress measurements on open-ended uh, piles. The next component of stress, which um, uh, needs to be considered, is the change in stress as we as we load our pile to failure. So initially, we've got sigma or C acting on our pile, and then we, as we load our pile, our shear stress increases. Um, we get an increase in radial stress as the 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 sand in the in the thin shear zone close to the pile wants to dilate. It tries to dilate, but the, it's constrained by the surrounding soil mass, and that increases the radial stress on the pile, and that then allows for extra additional um, dilation-induced dilation shear stresses on our pile. So that's the equation here. The, the actual uh, amount of radial stress change could be approximated like a cavity from cavity expansion theory, again, where this is basically the, 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 the shear stiffness of the soil mass. Y is the amount of shear-induced displacement and D is the pile diameter. Now, unfortunately, this is not the most, the most straightforward of relationships in real, real life because the value of the, the actual amount of dilation that you're, you're experiencing depends on the mean affected particle size. It depends on the relative roughness. In fact, it also depends on the actual uh, stress levels. And similarly, the actual shear modulus of the ground is not a linear value. The soil isn't elastic. And it depends, I suppose, on the cavity strain induced uh, next to the pile. Now, in terms of um, looking at, at that relationship, uh, just as an example, we had some measurements in Perth sand where there's self-boring mesh for self-boring pressure meter tests, where, where basically you're measuring that cavity expansion stiffness. And also in parallel, there were uh, constant normal stiffness tests done with, um, with different normal stiffness values. And these are kind of just general relationships which were obtained uh, in that per particular sand. Now you might say, uh, so what? So, but if we if we just look at, uh, at at the predictions we're getting for radial stress change from those relationships, it actually predicts a ratio with QC of of that radial uh, effect of stress change, which is actually uh, shown by the green dots here, reducing with diameter as diameter increases. And these are typical parameters inserted for a given relative density and stress level. Now, that's one set of measurements. Another set is we, we actually have actual physical measurements on instrumented piles. There's a lot of scatter. Um, this is, this is, these are instrumented measurements here. This is from the formulation. This is measured. You can see a lot of scatter. But this solid line here is a line described by that equation here which is also shown by this solid line here, and it matches pretty well the actual observed, um, cavity, well, the observations are generally in keeping with the cavity expansion prediction. Now, this is important to know this value because it's obviously a key factor in controlling the shaft friction of smaller diameter piles where 
the diameter d of the pile is quite small, and therefore this term is much more significant. When you go to larger off-scale shore piles, this, fact, this term is actually becomes, becomes uh, negligible. Now, lastly, the, the actual values which we need to think about in terms of uh, the overall Coulomb equation um, is the interface friction angle. Now, um, in, the, in, in, the, in the UWA and in the ICP methods in, in, in the API, there is a specification that in the absence of any measured values of delta, that you could assume a delta value which varies approximately with the D50 of the sand like this. So with siltier materials, you get a high delta value because you've got a low, you've got a high relative roughness. But as you go to larger D50 values, your relative roughness reduces and you get lower values. However, since then, and those tests were you know, dating back quite a while, since then, additional studies have shown that the actual interface friction angle um, is, is fairly constant if you allow for the fact that there's particle breakage near the tip of the pile under the annulus, that the, the, the sand is under very high stress, and it, you crush the sand to a, to a smaller uh, particle size. And also there's this large displacement shearing of the soil next to the shaft. And as a consequence, when, when those parameters, when they're modeled, uh, at least the, the, the large shearing model, you can see in, in these tests that there is a very narrow band of the actual delta value in, in, in the test. And therefore, we end up with uh, what we presumed was more or less constant value, 29 plus or minus 2 degrees, would be a good estimate for a delta value for a typical industrial steel pile um, and sand. Um, and lastly, just to consider end bearing, which sometimes isn't a huge component of, of resistance for, for offshore piles. But if we look at what um, the relationship we have with closed-ended piles, um, the database is not marvelous because of issues of correction for residual loads, etc. But what it is showing, if you look at the black dots here, is that the base capacity defined at 10% of the, of the pile diameter, this is a closed-ended pile, is approximately proportional to the QC value uh, near the tip of the pile. Now, we'd expect that because it's a very similar mode of penetration. And the reason it's only a half is that uh, we have only moved the, the pen pilot penetrometer a distance of half of 0.1 of a diameter. If you go, if you continue to push your pile, you end up with, with obviously a value which should be closer to one. Now, in, in this particular study, we determined the end resistance corresponding to a closed ended pile using a, a, a filtering procedure by, uh, in, in the CPT 2018 conference by Boulanger and De Jong. And that allows you to uh, allow, it allows for the, the larger zone of influence of a pile for starters and the influence of the sensing and development distance on the overall uh, um, end resistance, which is mobilized under steady state conditions. So what we're doing here is we're saying that this is an average value corresponding to um, th this QP value is a value corresponding to a pile with the same diameter, uh, uh, sorry, the penetrometer with the same diameter as a pile. Um, and it, as it happens, it seems to be, you know, for uniform science, you might expect it's, it's the, the open circuits here are showing that it's more or less comparable to uh, averaging QC within a couple of diameters of the actual pile tip. Now, for open-ended piles, um, um, we, if we find that actually that the pre-stressing associated with actually driving the pile gives to extra, extra capacity. So if you're looking at a, a closed-ended pile, the end effective area ratio is, is 1, and we get a ratio of QB 0.1 at QQP, which is the end resistance of a closed-ended pile of about 0.5. However, as you go... As the pile is, is, is begins to partially plug, you, you follow down this line here. By the time you're down close to this level here, you're almost fully coring, and the end bearing is, you know, of the order uh, of 15% of the of, of the cone resistance. So again, that's more or less uh, that is the that is more or less has been included now in in the unified method. We'll come back to that later. So having now just. Uh, talked about the actual background to the method. Um, in terms of the, uh, the uh, additions to the existing API CPT methods, um, we've got a new expression for dilation, 
it, there is no explicit re uh, recognition of the effects of partial plugging. We've reevaluated the interface friction angle. Um, we've allowed for, uh, I haven't talked about this, but uh, instrument data has shown that the, the, the shaft frictions tend to increase, you know, all the way up to close to the tip where almost you get the maximum value. So there has been cutoffs in the, in the existing API methods. We've allowed and looked at other functions, um, exponential distribution of, of friction along our pile shaft. And we've looked, uh, and obviously as I just talked about there, um, improved approach for evaluating the average, uh, average um, QC value near the tip of a, of a pile. In terms of the actual overall application of the uh, calibration of the database, items one or two are particularly important uh, for the smaller piles um, in the database. And just to emphasize that, uh, the database, and this has all been published uh, already at the SUT conference, you can see that the seven, of the 71 piles in our database, we've only got one here, which is of, a, of the typical scale of an offshore pile. All of the pile tests are in this region here with a sort of a median diameter of about you know, 600, five or 600 millimeters. So obviously that is an important, uh, important consideration. Um, and I'll, I'll, uh, these are the details of the test. There's some closed end of piles of compression, open end of piles of compression, and, uh, and similarly, intention open and closed ended uh, piles. So, okay, so in terms of then um, moving on, we're trying to, to objectively uh, and, and get agreement amongst all of the, the particular people involved in the, in the method. We looked at actually the, uh, an expression for the stationary radial effective stress. Where, which is a function of the QC value, as we've seen in instrumented tests, as a function of the distance from the pile tip, or H, or the distance from the pile tip normalized by the diameter, and as a function of the area ratio. And I won't go through all of these details here, but the F1 equation F1 is quite comparable to the UWAO5 method. Equation F2 is quite comparable to the ICP method. Um, and we've got other exponential terms here. We've got a um, an expression here, which is like the Alman Hamre prediction for radial effective stress, which is an exponential function without any diameter and uh, normalization for the H value. Okay, so we did, did those analysis. And um, because of the focus on offshore piles, and all offshore piles are open ended, um, we looked at the ratio of measure to calculate, uh, uh, determine the, the ratio of calculate, measure capacity to calculate capacity. Barry, you're, you're frozen now. And this then, this is what we practice for, folks. Barry, you dropped off for a minute. You were frozen. I think you should probably restart this slide. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so this slide here. Is this okay here? Sure. From here? I'm sorry. Yeah. So the the optimization procedure involved looking at uh, ratios of measured to calculated capacities. What we did is we determined that ratio for open and closed ended pile, oh, sorry, open ended piles only, which are typical of, of offshore piles. And um, we basically varied the coefficients on the preceding equations uh, in the size and preceding side to actually go and minimize the coefficient of variation of those ratios. And then simply we adjusted the coefficient to, to AI so that obviously we got a, a mean value of one. And because by definition, obviously, we want to put, be able to predict the capacity. So then we reviewed these results. We amended the coefficient to minimize any bias of this, uh, of this ratio with respect to diameter. And I should come back to those points in a second. Pile slenderness, relative density, and effective area ratio. And after doing that for the, for the actual open-ended piles, we then applied the method to all of the piles in the database. And then we, we, we basically examined the, the findings. Now, the findings were, were, um, were initially a quite a surprise to us all. Um, I won't give you, go through the, the equations here because it's not, it's not important. But what is important is that we, we have uh, equation F5, by the way, was, wasn't suitable. But all of the other equations were actually suitable. 
And interestingly, um, we can see that the coefficient of variation of all of these equations all are, is almost the same. So there, there is actually no difference between the ability for the database of equations F1 to F4 to predict the actual shaft friction. Uh, and you can see this is what we get for the 0.2 to 0.23 values are for the open-ended piles. When we applied um, the, all of the methods to include the closed-ended piles, uh, thankfully we also got pretty good predictions, which are all um, around about you know fairly reasonable coefficients of variation. Um, so that's so as you can see here, these coefficients of variation, which which you know really should be you know it represents the spread in predictions. So the lower the value there, the much better the method. And we can see obviously we're 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 an improvement on on those existing five methods. Um, but um, we're getting the same number. So the, the difficulty then arose is uh, why uh, what equation should we choose? And uh, and I suppose firstly I should say is that the reason that all of these equations were more or less the same is because of the critical inclusion of the dependence of radial effective stress on the distance from the pile tip uh, in those equations and, and, and obviously on QC. So all of the equations had that uh, feature and that's obviously a very important aspect of, of, uh, of, of the overall uh, equation. In terms of then saying, okay, well, what do we choose? Which equation do we choose? Um, and, you know, there was no um, bias here. Everybody, uh, you know, realistically looked at their information and said, well, what, what do we think is the better result? Now, I won't go, again, it's probably difficult to see these equations, but the, the dark line here shows measured frictions, and all of the other dotted hash lines here represent frictions measured, uh, predicted using each of those other four equations. And you can see for all of these piles from, you know, with their 760 millimeters down to uh, 32 millimeters, 220 millimeters, generally speaking, uh, they're all giving a, a reasonable fit, which is in line with their overall ability to predict um, the overall capacities relatively well. Now that's all very well. If you're looking, this is a, this is a, this is a distribution of rate of, of predicted uh, stationary radial effective stress divided by the QC value plotted against the distance from the pile tip H. This D here, this is a typical diameter. This is what the equations would predict for these equations. Now you can see that there is actually, you know, they're reasonably in agreement, as you might expect, because they're all predicting a reasonably the capacities of piles with this kind of magnitude uh, relatively well. However, when we then apply um, the equations to a two meter diameter pile, you can see a distinct difference here with equations F2 and F3 predicting much higher frictions, and F4, as it happens, predicting uh, lower frictions. So obviously, you know, if we were going to actually try and just look at that result in face value, you'd say, well, F3 and F4 does not represent a safe extrapolation uh, from the database. Now, we did have one pile uh, which wasn't in the unified database that because it had about um, 50 meters of soft clay overlying a uh, dense deposit. But we do have measurements of skin friction distributions in this one and a half meter di diameter pipe pile. And you can see these are, this is, this is the, the red line here, is, sorry, the black line here is the measured. The red line represents equation F1. But the other lines here are showing a deviation. You can see equation F2 over predicts the shaft friction near the tip of the pipe pile. And equation F4, which is uh, the open circle here, is actually a good deal less than the actual friction um, actually measured. Um, in terms of, um, if you look at bias uh, of the ratio of measure to calculate the capacity, which we did for a whole range of parameters, but I think of, of particular interest is the one for diameter. I'm looking just at open-ended piles, uh, as you have seen. Um, you see for equation F1, there's a, maybe a modest tendency for a slight uh, under prediction of capacity as your diam diameter increases. So the measure to calculate the ratio gets larger. So in other words, you're, you're on the conservative side if you're following that red line. However, for equation F4, you can see there's a strong bias in, in diameter of that particular case. And if you remember, um, that equation F4 didn't have any diameter term in its uh, friction fatigue term or its H 
H uh, uh, component. So at the end of the day, we selected equation F1, firstly because the predictions of uh, on closer examination of the examples I've shown you and other examples, the predictions of shaft friction distributions are marginally better um, for these two equations than F2 and F4, but sorry, but marginally better than equation F3, which had an exponential decay uh, with H over D. Um, we selected equation F1 because the bias with respect to the relative density, diameter, slenderness ratio, and uh, plugging, or oh, sorry, uh, effective area ratio was satisfactory. Um, compared to F3, it errs slightly on the cautious side um, we, for shorter piles, as, as, a, as the equation F3 gives you slightly larger frictions for shorter piles. And in, in fact, it also had the lowest coefficient of variation uh, for the four equations considered. So, so that, and, and the format, yeah. I suppose, we, uh, thankfully, is quite similar to existing um, CPT methods in the API ISO. So, so again, it won't be a, a significant sh change for, for practitioners. Um, I'm just nearly finished. Uh, last couple of slides. The, the, the actual, one, a couple of important points to have a look at. One is where the actual um, equation over predicted the capacity. And, and in terms of the ratio of the measured, capacity to the calculated capacity was less than 0.7 for six of the piles in 71, uh, six of the 71 piles. Now, in those cases, four of the piles were from the lock and dam site where there was very highly variable CPT data and many people have looked at these cases and I have found also they're incredibly difficult and they, they, they do seem to be outliers. And um, one of the piles at Dramen was actually falling into this category, but 12 other tests showed you know very good predictions you know on average about eight percent over prediction and um, so basically um, that would be considered as an outlier and then another test at Padre Island was tested two days after driving so obviously that probably didn't have significant setup so we'd be happy enough with with, with that um, observation so typically you know when you're driving a pile the, the capacity might be only 50 percent of the capacity as given by this um, by, by this method. So again, I won't go through the overall equations, but they're there in the, in the presentation for completeness. The only thing to note is that the only parameter that is actually required um, to determine your, your capacity is the, is the CPT end resistance. That, and that, that's, that's it, which is actually, you know, makes it quite amenable to, to, to immediate calculations directly without needing to do any laboratory tests. Um, I suppose one point I should raise in the context of offshore piles is that if you look at the formulation that we had, which were QB 0.1 was a function of the area ratio and um, uh, QC, we find that for typical offshore piles, uh, when you input into that equation, we're getting roughly about 15% of the, the QC near the base of the, of the pile as, as being the, the actual QB value. And that actually is very comparable to what you would get for a, for actually a, a board pile. And it appears that the overall plug compression uh, that is balanced approximately maybe by the higher in, in annular resistance. So in other words, the actual M bearing uh, of a board of, of an offshore pipe pile is comparable to that of a board pile. And remembering, of course, that actually under static loading, the, the actual plug remains um, fixed. And just final remarks, last slide. Um, just remind you, the method estimates the axiostatic capacity of driven piles in silica sands about two weeks after installation. And if you want to try out the method, there's a, a freeware at this particular website there, which you can use. Just uh, paste in your your, uh, your your CPT data. Another point is that essentially, no, this method is by no means um, uh, perfect. Um, if like just even if you just you know did a really uh, trivial calculation, you will find that you'd need a factor of safety of 1.7, assuming a normal distribution, to obtain a probability of failure below uh, 1 in 1,000. Obviously, there's lots of other reliability issues to, to consider, which uh, Farrakh will mention. But having, the reason I'm saying that is that the method has definitely got scope for improvement. Um, it's empirical, and like all empirical methods, it's probably, you know, it will be replaced by a better method tomorrow. But, but we should at least... Um, I think 
retain the the unified database as as a as a basis for advancing um, new methods because I think it it's certainly proved the best way of ensuring that all of the people involved in all of these different methods actually came came and agreed upon things because the first thing is we got got the data right before we started doing any calibrations. Okay, that, that that's all for me. Thanks very much. Yeah. So um, I will just show a few slides before we um, close off this session. Let's see. Um, well, just last last few slides, I just want to say a few words about the reliability of the computed axial capacity with this unified CPT-based method and show you some comparisons between the predicted capacity with this method uh, as compared to other methods. Uh, I guess Barry already mentioned the uh, mean and, and, and standard deviation and coefficient of variation of predictions of this method. and. Um, here you can see all sorts of numbers. Uh, the, uh, this lecture is basically too short to go into detail about this reliability of these methods. Uh, there's, we have a keynote lecture at the ESFOG. For those of you who are interested to participate in ESFOG, we will go into much more detail on the reliability of the methods. But as you can see, this unified method has um, coefficient of variation of the order of 20 to 25 percent, which is as good as one could expect to get with an empirical prediction method. Uh, I've been showing the predictions of this uh, method compared to the other methods for, for some typical um, um, Soil profiles, uh, maybe it's, it's difficult for you to see what is what here, but the um, pink curve shows the prediction of the unified method. The other, the green curve shows the prediction of the um, uh, traditional API method. And the other four curves show the prediction of the four other CPT-based methods. So as you can see for this uh, first case, which is a dense sand profile on the left, uh, the unified method is predicting a capacity, which is almost right in the middle of the four other methods. And it's maybe a factor of two to three greater than what you would get with the, with the API method. The second case um, is a, a, a deep clay layer down to 40 meters, but then underneath the clay layer, there's a dense sand layer. And uh, also in this case, uh, as far as we are in the clay layer, the five methods or the six methods which are shown here predict more or less the same capacity. Once we get to the dense sand layer, the API method is predicting a much lower capacity than, than the CPT-based methods. And in this particular case, the unified method is on the lower side of, of the four other CPT-based methods. In each of these curves, we have a um, brown line that shows the tip of the actual pile that was designed in that particular site. Uh, Two more case studies, which are not too different from the first two that you saw. The one on the left here is also a dense sand profile. And same trend, the API method is predicting lower capacity than CPT-based methods. And the unified method is uh, somewhat on the lower side of the previous CPT-based methods. The other case is also a layered profile, but the pile design is such that the tip of the pile is in a dense sand profile. And again, the same trend. But, uh, but this is what we had, were expecting beforehand. You know, the CPT-based methods generally predict much higher capacity in dense sands than, than the traditional API method. Um, if we go to the case with the loose sand, with the intermittent clay layers, then the situation is reversed. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the figure on the left. This is the figure on the right. And uh, in this case, uh, it's a layered profile, but the dance layer, the, the sand layers are, are, are quite loose. And, and here you can see that the API method, which is the green line, is predicting a greater capacity than all of the CPD-based methods and, and, and greater than the um, 
unified method. And actually, if you want to have the, if you were designing the pile in this particular profile with the unified method, then uh, you would conclude that 95 meter, which is the uh, length of the pile here, is not enough to give you enough capacity. You had to go to 110 meters. So it doesn't give you greater capacity than the API methods in all situations. But generally, if you have a dense sand profile, you would get a larger capacity with the unified method. And if you have a loose sand profile, you would get a larger capacity with the traditional API method. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I think we have a few minutes for, um, for uh, questions. So I'll stop my presentation. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Nadim and Professor Nihan. Um, great presentation. We have tons of questions, actually a lot of interest in this, and I'll do my best to go through them um, and, and answer them. One of the um, questions that came up, and um, uh, actually I'll, I'll bring this up because it was closer to the, to the uh, last slide that uh, Farag, you presented. For sand that does not dilate, say loose sand, what is the guidance? What's the ultimate guidance should we use? Should we use the API or the unified method? <laughs> well, um, I don't know. My, my, obviously, my preference is the unified method, not because it's more conservative, but I, I think we, we have, it's more representative of what you actually have in C2. But I don't know, Barry, maybe you should have a few words yeah, on this. Well, we, we, we've got about, I think about, probably from memory, about five or six cases in our database where the sand has got a relative density between 35 and 50%, which is probably as loose as you're going to get in practice. And the method does uh, very well. In fact, it, it tends to be slightly conservative in, in those materials. So, so I would definitely recommend uh, uh, the CBT base. Thank you. Our next question has to do with limitations of our tools. In very dense sand layers, most CPT, CPT measurements become, you know, hit refusal. So there's a limitation with QMAX, and, and of course there's discontinuity on the, on the QMAX itself. Uh, how reliable the estimation of capacity in very dense sand where refusal occurs might be? <laughs> well, that's, that's also a, it's, a, it's an excellent question often encounter in, in offshore sand. For example, in the North Sea, where the relative density of sands is 100 to 120 percent, you, you generally get refusal, and, and, and you end up with a discontinuous uh, CPT profile where the, many of the data points just representing the maximum, capa uh, maximum uh, capacity of that CPT device. Um, how reliable is this method? Well, I mean, when your CPT maxes out, I mean, you really don't have a choice except just using that number as the basis for your design. You cannot push it beyond. And, and as Barry mentioned, you know, we, we, our database is, is limited to, to what it is. And then we don't have any case with like 100, 110% relative density in our database. So, so we're extrapolating and we have to be very careful in extrapolation. But we think that this method, the way we're doing the extrapolation, is it's conservative enough that you would, if you use those maximum values, you you should you should be fine, in my opinion. Barry, if you want to. Uh, yeah, I mean, one of the things, I mean, I mean, the questions you've asked so far is, is it applicable to here? Is it applicable to there? I mean, the the the, the basis of the method is that actually we're trying to base the method on actually the physical mechanism. So. The relationship with QC arises because it's, it's a representative of the actual horizontal stresses near the tip of the pile as you're driving it in. So, you know, we in the database, we've got QC values, you know, ranging from 1 MPA to 80 MPA. And, the, you know, in terms of the, the, the methods, so it's applicable. So I, I wouldn't be picking and choosing and saying, you know, I use it here and I won't use it there. I think... We have to try and rely on the fact that we're we're never going to be in exactly the same conditions as a database point, but we need to be trusted. You know, the 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 the, the thought behind the method is such that we should be at the very least uh, slightly on the conservative side. Thank you. Next question is uh, is a two part question. Any attempts on load movement modeling of piles using CPT data? <laughs> 
That's the part yes, one. There, there, yes, there's a there's a paper in Geotechnique Letters which uh, has updated the API TZ curves uh, with with the unified method. Uh, so basically, the Z peak on D value, for example, is a function of the of the QC and the depth. Yeah. Thank you. Second part would how do we uh, handle the effects of liquefaction during driving? The seismic excitation of, of CPT data using CPT data. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure if that's uh, within the uh, within the context of what we presented today. This liquefaction is is is, is completely separate issue. And and uh, but are you are you, uh, is the, is is the question related to liquefaction during pile driving, or is it liquefaction assessment for size? No, for capacity loss of capacity due to liquefaction. Loss of capacity due to liquefaction during size. Well, I mean that's 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 a separate problem. I mean if you have liquefaction, then then you have to reassess all your capacities. Excellent. Thank you. Um, have another uh, two-part method. I don't know, we're two minutes past. I don't know if we have enough time to go through these questions. Brad, can you uh, provide input here? Can we carry on with questions? Keep on going. I would say Excellent. we can probably go another five or 10 minutes, so. Thank you. All right, so another two-part question. Does the method account for possible influence of high base resistance mobilization on shaft resistance? Part one. Part two is it's been reported that pile capacity tends to increase in the first two years after installation. How would a calculation mm. method that is based on purely on CPT data reflect this? Um, I don't mind. Uh, so, so in terms of the the notion that you know your your sh your base and your shaft resistance are are interdependent is is kind of a strange one in my view. Obviously, if you, you if you're getting a high base resistance, you're also in a high QC material, and that carries forward into into the method. So I don't I don't see any there, there is no logic to assume that you know there there's a actually the relationship's already inbuilt into into the into the equations. And um, and the second point was. It's the time effect, the gain, gaining time capacity effect, yeah. of time. But that's obviously, you know, there's a lot of work, um, certainly at UWA we're doing a lot of work. I know all, all around the world there's a lot of uh, interest in this topic. And um, essentially there's there's been proposals to go and basically modify the the, the, sh the, the base capacity doesn't change with time, but the shaft friction will increase with time. As I was saying, around about driving, it might be about half the shaft friction you're getting um, from the unified method. After about a year, it's probably double the shaft friction uh, on average. Uh, but there, there, so, so really, it's probably going to be ultimately um, a modification factor. But that modification factor needs to properly reflect the mechanisms of, of, of that's controlling the aging. And at the moment, there's not not a massive. There there is a there is a good agreement. Everything is pointing in the right direction, but I don't think we're quite there yet to say that a seven meter diameter monopile is going to have the same aging as a as a five hundred millimeter onshore pile. Um, there is there's still some debate uh, on on diameter effect, for example. Yeah, but regarding the time effects, I mean, the, the, there's also a question of. Um, what sort of problem we're looking into. If, if you're doing a design for, for a new structure, of course, then you just have to uh, take the worst case scenario of when, when, when is the design load going to hit it. It may hit it in the, in the first winter storm. But if you're doing reassessment for an existing platform that's been in operation for 30, 40 years, and of course, then, uh, then you have justification for maybe assessing the effect of time on, on, your, on your calculated pile capacity and then maybe the design rules have changed in the meantime and, and that's what's going to save you from from having to you know abandon that platform or not so it's it's a very important issue but what as Barry says you know this is ongoing research and there are lots of aspects that have to be clarified for example the effect of cyclic loading how does that influence these time effects but but there is something there definitely. So 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 if if you have a relevant problem, it's, it's definitely worth looking into that. Excellent, thank you. 
Uh, there's another question that has to do with uh, resistance factors and material factors. It reads, uh, besides the resistance factor of 1.7, do we need to also use material partial factors when using CPT method? For example, by reducing the, uh, the QC values. I'll leave that question to Farrakh, and I apologize for using that number 1.7. I, yeah, but, I, I, but that's, that's the danger, Barry. <laughs> when you throw out a number, it sticks in people's heads. <laughs> no, we, we, we're not recommending any, any particular material resistance factor. And, and, and how you combine, I mean, I'm a, more a fan of a resistance factor rather than a material factor. But, but you apply these partial factors to where your uncertainties are. And, and as long as you're consistent in, in, in how you combine these things in the calibration of the code, uh, then, then you should be achieving the, the level of safety that's been intended by the code. But, uh, but I don't think any code recommends both of them. So, so in, you know, when you're using a CPT-based method, the, the, the nice thing is that the CPT is what it is, is what you're measuring, and then you're using it directly to predict the capacity. So then you should be applying a resistance factor and, and not changing your CPT with an artificial material factor. Thank you very much. Okay, the next question reads, do we have measure capacities, for example, pile load te uh, tests from, from those cases that uh, Professor Nadim, you presented in, in the last few slides? Uh, for those cases, no. There we just we, we, these are our existing platforms, and and we don't know what the capacity is. We just know that it's it's more than what they've experienced so far in terms of storms. But uh, in recent years, there have been some large diameter pilot tests, but unfortunately, the um, the results of those tests are all confidential. They've been through commercial projects, so they're not publicly available yet. Understood. Next question is, uh, compressibility been taken into account in capacity calculations for relatively long offshore piles? Have, have pile compressibility been taken into account for long offshore piles? Well, the well sands don't tend to get a post-peak soften, so yeah. it doesn't really matter. Thank you. The next question is, what's your opinion about using the unified method for soil resistance to driving calculations, SRD calculations? Okay. Well, I, well, at the moment, I, I'm actually doing some work at the moment on that um, yeah. and hope to present something at the Stress Wave Conference in, in um, where is it, in Rotterdam, I think. Um, but yeah, it's, essentially, it's not the same. You, got, you, you can't use the same because what you're getting is a static capacity when the plug is is stationary and it's two weeks after after driving. So it's, it's not the same as the capacity, but certainly the mechanisms are very similar, And um, but it needs to be adapted. Yeah, and I can also mention that one of our sponsors in, in this JIP, they, they developed kind of an in-house pile in the static resistance to driving model, which is inspired by the unified method, but it's not exactly the same coefficients. So they've calibrated it to their own database of you know, hundreds or thousands of pile driving records that they have. We have another question that has to do with the database um, and, and uh, how the method compared to databases that are becoming, uh, are, are being published as, as we move forward. For example, in DFI 2021, uh, there has been methods pu uh, published, databases published by Moshfegi, Islami, and Hosseini um, in DFI 2022. And it's, have you had a chance to look at those databases and compare them to the unified method? No, but I, I do think that it would be great if those workers, you know, like I said to you, one of the biggest problems was actually picking out 71 of those 300 pile tests we looked at and agreeing on, 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 the, most, on, on the test that we could categorically say that is the low displacement behavior, that is the CPT at the, lo at the location, exactly all of the required information, that is the, the kind of sand we're dealing with is exactly the same. My experience is that a lot of databases include lots of different aspects which we, normally we, didn't, we did not include. Like for example, there's lots of clay layers in many database cases, there's lots of retests, there's lots of dynamic tests. Uh, and essentially when you come down to, because we trawled the, the literature up to 2017 and really there's not a lot of 
you know, good quality load tests there. So if there are new tests available, you know, really, I'd, I'd love if those authors got in touch with, with all of us to actually go and see how we could try and move things on. Because obviously, you know, that, that's, that, that's the way to, to advance things. Thank you. Our next question has to do with um, interface angle friction. How the interface friction angle of 29 degrees measured when the soil is plugged using H piles? It, it, it's not, it's not, I mean, we, we're not dealing with H piles, but certainly it's not the same because it, no. with a H pile, you, you, you know, you're, you're generally speaking with a soil to soil type of interface and it's not the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, on, how on were the, the side? Uh, yes. How were the side shear and end bearing resistances separated for the test piles? Were all the test piles instrumented? Yeah. Well, no, not not all. I mean, all of them had load displacement at at the at the top of the pile, and few of them had instrumentation along the pile where we could separate. But actually, when it came to really separating what is the base resistance and what is the friction, we we, we only ended up with very few tests that that could uh, give us any useful information there. So so that's yeah that's a problem. But uh, many of these tests also are are, are run uh, are loaded in tension. So so there you don't have you only have the friction that's contributing. So that made it um, kind of solve part of our problem. But when it comes to separating these things, and and you should remember, I mean, this um, measurements the the the. There's a lot of uh, measurement error as well. That can small errors in 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 load measurements in in, in the pile can turn into relatively large errors in the, in the in the estimate of the friction. And and um, yeah, so the, most of our focus was on the total capacity that we measure at top of the pile. But Barry, maybe you want to expand. No, no, that's that. right. I think I think we certainly we. We, we, you know, we tension, tension tests were very useful in, in, in helping us. That there was Euripides is like an example of a very good quality pile test, series of pile tests which were instrumented, other ones in, in other sites. But, you know, really, I think you, you really got to go and look at the literature and find that there is a real shortage of good quality pile load tests that, that people can actually stand over. I mean, uh, and I think you know if you, the more the more you look into any of these case studies, the more problems are often arise. And and so I I think it's you know if you can if you if you try and cut corners, uh, you'll make you'll, you'll you'll end up with the wrong conclusions. And that's what took us four years, three years to put together, um, you know this just the, this database. And actually everything was digitized. Everything is 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 agreed. And you know, getting agreement with all of those um, other other organisations, including the steering committee, is not an easy task. And and you know, and even then, we found in some cases that you know there was disagreement. So, so I think you know, the big, it's easy. It sounds easy. It sounds like we should have a thousand pile tests from around the world, but we but we don't. And they should all be instrumented. Of course, they should. But you know, you driving stresses would usually set all the strain gauges off anyway to start with. And um, so there's lots of problems out there <laughs> that need to be solved, yeah? and this is just a, we, we like to think this is a start, start rather yeah. than an end. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, there is we're, we're really over time, and I, I think we should bring it to a close. Uh, thank you very much for your presentations and all your time and answering all those questions. Also, thank you very much to our participants for for staying, uh, bearing with us, and then going through this presentations and asking so many interesting questions. Brad, over to you. Thanks, Arash and, and Barry and Farouk. Great job today. That was fantastic. The interaction kind of speaks for itself. When you get a lot of questions like that, I think it means you did a really good job. So thanks again to our presenters. And as Arash said, thanks to all our viewers for sticking around. This was a great session. As a reminder, we've got three more of these. There will be one each month all the way through June. So there will be an April one. It's on April 28th. So you'll want to be looking for some marketing material coming from us on that very soon. As we said at the beginning, registration for ISFOG opens tomorrow, March 16th. We hope that you can join us in person in Austin at the end of August. We would love to see 
each and every one of you. And if you liked what you saw today, again, click subscribe, click get notifications. We'll let you know every single time we post something new to the YouTube channel. There's a lot of great content up here. We certainly hope you take some time to explore it. So thanks again to our presenters and to our viewers. Have a great day, and we hope we see some of you at Geo Congress in Charlotte next week.